Hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, is also a very important pathology as it is the most common cause of renal failure in children and it presents in a very similar way to the previous primary hemostasis pathologies that we have discussed with slight few differences. Now to define hemolytic uremic syndrome we can look at the name again. Hemolytic means there is some sort of hemolysis occurring and in this case again it is due to micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia. Uremic means that there is some sort of renal dysfunction occurring, there is an acute kidney injury or there is acute renal failure occurring and syndrome means that this is a syndrome. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is the result of endothelial damage either by drugs or infection. So if we consider the pathophysiology of hemolytic uremic syndrome, we first start off with a blood vessel. The endothelial lining of this vessel is injured. The injury is most commonly due to an infection by E. coli O157H7. Now this bacterium contains a toxin known as Shiger toxin, which when released damages the endothelium and causes an injury. Other causes of endothelial damage include non shigotoxin related injury, familial causes where there is excess complement activation resulting in injury, as well as idiopathic causes where the pathophysiology is simply unknown. So we have familial causes and idiopathic causes. So once we have an injury on the endothelial surface, we know that von Willebrand factor will bind and this will allow a platelet to bind and form a clot. Now, once a thrombus has formed here, a red blood cell attempts to squeeze through this very tight, narrow space and is subsequently split in half into fragments known as schistocytes or helmet cells and we have previously discussed this. So this is the pathophysiology and it is very similar to TTP except that it occurs most commonly via shigotoxin of E. coli. So if we summarize this we have one endothelial damage. Secondly we have thrombus formation and thirdly, we have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So this is what causes the AKI and the renal failure, which is the most common clinical feature of HUS. However, other organs can also be involved, including the central nervous system and the brain, as well as the heart, intestines and pancreas. Right, so HUS contains very similar clinical features to TTP so you should include TTP in your differential diagnosis. HUS is characterized by microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia or low platelets and an acute kidney injury. What differentiates HUS from TTP is that HUS occurs mainly in children under five years of age and is usually due to an infection by the Shiger toxin producing E. coli 0157H7 as we've previously mentioned. Patients with HUS present with dysentery which is inflammation of the bowels resulting in a mucousy bloody diarrhea as well as abdominal pain. As we've mentioned, patients present with similar features to TTP, including microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, pupera, fever, acute kidney injury, as well as neurological abnormalities, although these are rare in HUS. There are three main risk factors for HUS, and these include ingestion of contaminated food or water, 
as you recall, if the food or water is contaminated with E. coli, then the patient can develop HUS. Patients can be genetically predisposed. And another risk factor is if there is an outbreak of toxicogenic E. coli. Right, so I've listed here a few investigations you might consider. For each of these, pause the video and have a guess at what you might find. Now, in the full blood count, you would find low platelets as well as an anemia due to the loss of the red blood cells and thus loss of hemoglobin. If you do a blood film, this would show schistocytes, and we've previously described why this is in terms of the slicing mechanism. If you do a coagulation screen, this would show a normal PT and a normal APTT, and the reason for this is because this is a pathology of primary hemostasis rather than secondary hemostasis, and thus the coagulation cascade remains intact. The bleeding time would be increased due to the decrease in platelets. The LDH level will be increased, and this is because once red blood cells lyse, they release LDH. This is also seen in TTP. You would also check U and E's, and the reason for this is that the patient is presenting with diarrhea and an AKI, so they could develop hyperkalemia, hypo or hypernatremia, acidosis due to bicarbonate loss, as well as hyperphosphatemia. And the reason for this is that the diarrhea results in loss of water, sodium, and bicarbonate. And with the AKI, patients are unable to reabsorb sodium, and also they retain hydrogen ions causing an acidosis, and potassium causing hyperkalemia. You would also do a creatinine, which would be increased due to the AKI. A haptoglobin, now this is a molecule found inside plasma which binds to hemoglobin as soon as it's released into circulation so this would be decreased. You would also do a stool culture to confirm the E. coli infection. In terms of treatment, the treatment is quite similar to that of TTP. In addition, because of the diarrhea, the patient might be dehydrated and this might exacerbate the acute kidney injury. So you might consider giving the patient IV crystalloids and as with TTP you would do plasma phoresis as well as corticosteroids the important thing here is to not use antibiotics antibiotics are not used against the E. coli or 157H7 infection as this can increase the risk and exacerbate HUS and lead to a poorer prognosis now, if indicated, you might consider doing dialysis. Irreversible AKI or renal damage might require a transplant. However, this is extremely rare.